now I'm going to start it. Good afternoon, all. Good afternoon, Mass General Brigham's folks and community partners. Welcome to the Community Partner Lunch and Learn series. The MGB Community Cares Team, in partnership with MGB colleagues, developed this series to highlight the incredible work in our of our community partners and how critical it is for MGB to have strong partnerships with community organizations to advance community health. While this has always been true, the COVID pandemic has yet underscored this reality. In partnership with multiple Boston community organizations, MGB mobilized to provide resources and address the needs of community members throughout the pandemic. Since March 2020, these efforts include providing over 20,000 care kits, 5,000 vaccines, 25,000 food boxes, 15,000 hot meals, and over 30 events to bring health information, services, resources to communities. We couldn't have done any of this without our community partnerships and colleagues leading the way. We hope that this Lunch and Learn series highlights and honors some of our community partners and allows Mass General Brigham staff to deepen and understand, understanding of what their essential and impressive work of our community partners. Also learning ways that we can add value to these organizations and partnerships. We are excited to speak with the incredible panelists today and talk about their importance of working and supporting at Promise Youth. We encourage everybody to use the Q&A button at the, at the bottom of your screen to ask questions to our panelists and to follow up with us if you would like to connect with anyone after this discussion. To get us started today, my name is Rasan Peters. I am the BWA, BW, the BWH Violence Recovery Program Coordinator within Burn and Trauma. I am thrilled to be co-moderating this Lunch and Learn with Carlita. Carlita, would you love to introduce yourself? Yes, thank you so much, Rasan, and thank you to everyone who is logged in here today, as well as our esteemed panelists. My name is Carlita Chambers Walker. I am a community leader, as well as the Supplier Diversity Outreach and Engagement Manager for the City of Boston. And I'm going to jump right into the conversation um, and introduce Jonathan Marquez, the Director of YOU Boston, and ask if you could please describe your program, a little bit about yourself and, and where you're, you're based out of. Great, thank you very much. Um, very happy to be here today. My name is Jonathan Macrez and uh, I've been with Youth Options Unlimited Boston for about 10 years. <laughs> um, started as a summertime staff, just looking to work with young adults. Thought I was gonna be a BPS teacher and just love the work that we did in the community. Um, I found out that working with youth on job sites was just like <laughs> working in the classroom, just with a different setting. Um, we do a lot of soft skill development with our young people. Um, and we serve 14 to 24 year olds. We are in Roxbury, right in Nubian Square. Um, and we've been there since I've been there. And we serve Dorchester, Roxbury, Mattapan primarily, um, but certainly Hyde Park, South End, um, all of our young people are young people of color. Some are dealing with the justice system. Um, some are dealing with gang involvement, um, but all of them are looking for basically success within the workforce and finishing high school or getting back into school. So our mission is to basically empower them to do so. And I'm happy to be here. Thank you, Jonathan. We're thrilled that YLU Boston could join us here today. Next, I would like to introduce Kevin Barton from Youth Connects. He is the executive director. Kev, can you please introduce yourself, um, Youth Connects, talk about your location, the catchment area, a little bit of everything, your mission. Uh, we'd we'll love to know what, what is Youth Connects. Sure. Thanks, Rasan. Um, and, and thank you, uh, MGB, for including Youth Connect at the table. Uh, so I actually took on the role of executive director about three months ago. Uh, however, I, I've been a part of Youth Connect for almost 13 years. Um, so Youth Connect is a violence prevention, uh, intervention, and advocacy program of Boys and Girls Clubs of Boston in partnership with the Boston Police. So we started back in 1996, and we place licensed clinical social workers uh, inside police stations that see 
basically the highest rates of youth arrests, um, providing free on-site voluntary uh, community-based mental health services to young people uh, between the ages of about 10 to 24 um, and uh, their families, and basically uh, for, uh, from officers that are really concerned about them. So we're located in six stations um, and three citywide units, uh, including the Youth Violence Strike Force, also known as the gang unit, um, the school police unit, and the domestic violence unit. And we work with families and, and young people to really address the underlying problems and uh, social emotional issues that contribute to juvenile uh, crime. And youth are honestly, they're typically referred to us for any variety of reasons, uh, including arrests for uh, weapons carrying, uh, drugs, school truancy, gang affiliation, community violence, um, uh, human trafficking, exploitation, uh, you name it. And um, once our social workers actually receive referrals from the officers, they'll, they'll reach out and, and conduct a comprehensive intake and psychosocial assessment to really get a sense of what, what's going on, who's involved, what are the strengths and uh, you know, what's been tried. And uh, happy to say that about 84% of uh, folks we reach out to actually accept services with us. And, uh, and once we you know, are working with them, we're gonna offer them some support in three tiers, uh, what we call resource coordination or clinical case management, which is a lot of advocacy work. And, um, and then also therapy services uh, that really looks at establishing goals that are gonna improve their overall functioning in the home, school, and community. Um, and so we, we're really, really working to help make sure that young people um, and families are not falling through the cracks of what we often think of as overstretched systems. So thank you, happy to be here. Awesome, thank you, Kevin. We're glad that you could be here today and, and share all the, the great work that you're doing and congratulations on the new role. Now I'd like to introduce both Will Dunn and Stephanie O'Shea from College Bound Dorchester slash Boston and Quarter. Great program. I had a chance a little overlap with you guys. Will is the Director of College Readiness Advisors and Stephanie is the Government Relations Manager. And Will and Stephanie, I want to start off by asking, could you introduce yourselves and just tell me a little bit about where you're located, your mission, and all of the, the programs that you guys work out of to, to make Boston and our and our youth better. So thank you. I am Will Dunn, um, the director. Been working at College Bound um, for six years. We are located in Dorchester on Bowdoin Street. And our mission is to try to end gang violence. And so we work with the population of the guys that's driving the violence in these neighborhoods, Dorchester, Rock, Roxbury, Mattapan, et cetera, South End. Um, so the, the focus is to engage with these guys, build relationships, get them to have a different mindset and using um, education as a hook. So to try to get guys to get their GEDs and to go to college to try to push themselves to do different things with themselves in a nutshell. Hi, thanks. Uh, Steph O'Shea. So I manage government relations for Boston Uncornered. Um, as Dan said, we work with the uh, heaviest gang involved individuals throughout the city um, with the goal of putting them into um, a post-secondary education. So we set that high expectation and we support that through mentors like Will, as well as uh, mental health supports and a financial incentive through a stipend to allow them to fully focus on their educational pathway. Um, I manage our government funding, which is federal, state, and city, which makes up about 40% of our budget, um, and get to also work with great partners like um, the folks over at the Brigham. So thanks for having us. Awesome. Thank you. So thank you to everyone who shared a little about your program, your mission, and just overall the reason why we're here today. And before we dive into the specific panelist questions, I want to open the conversation asking each and every one of you, what does at promise risk mean to you? And why is it important that we use that term? Um, don't all go at once. Feel free um, to just jump right in. Um, actually, I'll look at my left first. Um, Kevin, do you want to go first and, and share what at promise uh, excuse me, I promise you've been to see you. Yeah, yeah, sure. Thank you, Carlita. Um, so honestly, I, I, I really believe strongly that language and words matter, right? Uh, how we speak about and to young people makes a difference. It matters. Um, you know, a more strengths-based description to me at Promise Youth 
is, is a way of referring to young people for whom I think we, as a, honestly, we have not kept our promise to as a community or society. Um, I, I think it's a much more positive way of thinking about young people that really externalizes the, the systemic barriers that often make success that much more difficult to attain, right? So instead of blaming groups of young people who have historically been, I think, marginalized or underserved, um, and effectively disconnected from, honestly, the, the abundance of resources and opportunities available, um, we see the potential of, of every young person we serve and help to elevate opportunities that, that are gonna enable them to, to not just like make it day to day, but actually thrive. So to me, that's what that promise means. Spot on, thank you. And I will go to Jonathan to my right. Great, thank you. Um, when I, when um, first of all, I, I applaud the, the terminology as well. I think that it is uh, definitely stepping in the right direction. That promise to me, what comes to mind is resiliency. Um, and so for those of us that have been working with young people for a long time that have been dealing with struggles that go beyond um, average young adults or even average young adults in, in low income um, neighborhoods, whatever you want to say, um, the, the amount of toughness and the amount of uh, adversity that, that's been facing them for basically their whole young adult life um, translates to tremendous success um, when provided with pathways and opportunities, inspiration and, and um, mentorship that organizations present really provide. So there is so much promise um, giving young people the opportunity, whether it's they are older and it's a second chance opportunity, we're talking about young um, youth, um, or adult um, release um, coming out of incarceration as well. They, they, it goes on and on, but the kind of, that's what really resonated with me is that there's so much promise because once in positions, there's so much more uh, grit and toughness than folks that have maybe been given mostly everything in their life. So that's what came to mind when I heard uh, at Promise. Awesome, thank you for that. And Steph, may I have you go next? Thank you. So for us and the work that we do, um, we see our young people as the drivers of change in their community. So the idea of at promise to us is that, you know, they are the promise to the communities that they were in. Um, they have caused pain and chaos within their communities, but the goal is that they have transformed into individuals who want to go back and change that um, to build the neighborhood up to build up the next generation of young people. Um, you know, we know that I'm not the one that can change a community. They're the ones that have that ability. And so we wanna uplift them and support them, um, helping them to get uh, through college into a career pathway to be able to change their own trajectory as well as those, um, you know, their, their children, um, the ones that come after them. And I, I'm sure Dunn has even more to add to that. Absolutely. And last but not least, Dunn, would love to hear from you as well. For me, I'm, I'm normally the one that goes against the grain every time we do some type of new language or to me, to me it gets uh, redundant with the high risk, at risk, proven risk. But um, using this terminology is definitely a, a more positive um, spin to it. And coming from the community, being a knucklehead when I was younger, I always hate the whole idea of classifying or identifying, you know, specifically calling a group of people at risk or high risk and all that simple stuff. But putting this term, new terminology together really opened my eyes up to see that um, we could roll with something different where it comes off right as positive that we're not coming in on some negative stuff. So I applaud the new efforts on the new terminology. Wow. Thank you everyone for that important framing around what at promise means. Um, we're excited to dive into the rest of our discussion with our panelists today. For an overview, um, the first part of our conversation, we'll talk on the core work for each organization. Then we're gonna talk and engage about self-care. And then we're gonna end it by focus on ways that we can support these organizations in their realms. So um, again, we're excited to speak to this incredible panelist today um, about the work that they're doing. 
Um, if you have any questions, we um, encourage everyone to use the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen to ask questions for our panelists. So I'll start this off. Um, can you all please tell us the day in the life of somebody impacted by incarceration or reentry? How does your program both su support the resiliency and strengths of the individuals who are impacted by incarceration? So um, I'm gonna pass it to one cornered first. Um, Stephanie Dunn, whichever way you all, or if you wanna tag team it, but um, please, I would love to hear from you guys. Yep, so for a reentry part is, again, um, I come from the, the, the life. Um, it, it's never, like we, we have these things called programs, but when you're dealing with people's lives, it's not no program when it comes down to the life. So it becomes these relationships, relationships that we're building, it becomes more like family. So someone that was in the program, quote unquote program is locked up the same way if it was my cousin, you don't leave your cousin in jail by himself without having the right, send people through, help understand certain stuff. Not because I've been to prison myself, all the guys that, um, might go back and forth to prison. We try to teach them why they're in there. So if I'm out here talking to you and you're a young boy and you're, you're ripping and running, everything's going fast, you can't really hear or see what's going on because you're hustling, you got the girls, other blocks know your name, you know, on that end you're shining, but you get locked up now, it's more of a time for me to drop more jewels on you to say, what's your focus? What's your focus on your kids? What's your focus on your credit? What's your focus on building a better day for yourself when you come home? And so um, so it becomes a little more easy on a reentry part that you plant these seeds first while they was out, second while they in where they can hear you more. So when they're on their way back out, they have a good strong structure for your first one or three year goals to get going so you can stay away from this lifestyle. Thank you, Well, Thank you, Stephanie. You wanna add anything to that? Now done, nailed it. Thank you. Yes, yes. Youth Connects, Kevin. Please add something to that. Uh, yes, I'm like, what, what to add that I think Dunn hasn't said. Um, it, you know, it, I, I think the relationships piece. You know, uh, that that is that is huge. Uh, so, so for us, yeah, I, I think one of the hardest things, honestly, to bear witness to when working with a young person who's incarcerated or detained, it, it's really the. Um, the control of their basic freedoms, right? And to see some of that really taken away. Um, there, there's inherently, I think, some sometimes a um, this, this dehumanizing, I, I think, aspect to the system. And so much of our work with the young folks that we work with is really helping people, young people, to remain hopeful, to see their humanity, because it's there, and to get through the day to day. Um, you know, we're fortunate to be able to enter into DYS uh, detention facilities or to go into the House of Corrections and the jails. And, and, and that's a privilege. And, and so we can continue that care, you know, that, that may have started in the community, right? We want to be able to continue. it. And being able to show up, I, I think, means so much to, to our young people. Because I, I think for so many, there's this isolation that can happen. And so we show up just to say, hey, you still matter to us, and we're going to help you get through this. Um, you know, I, I think there's often a protective mindset that kind of happens for some of the, the folks that, that we do have the privilege to work with in, in the, um, when they're inside, um, you know, because they're, they're getting through their day to day, right? And, you know, we will still do the individual work. It may look a little different, right, in terms of, you know, if we're going in and doing therapy, right? But we're going to be there and we're, we're going to let you kind of work through some things uh, with us in, in, in the hopes of, like you said, Dunn, that we're going to plant some seeds, right? Let's talk a little bit about what you might need. You know, our young people are so incredibly strong and resilient. Um, and, you know, we, we, I think a lot of times we're really trying to work with them to kind of say, hey, look, you, you made a mistake. Mistakes happen. They do, that's part of being human. And so let's talk about it. Let's figure out some of the underlying reasons, what got you there? And how can we plant those seeds that you talked about that and really think about them when you come out? How, how are we gonna still be there to get you where you wanna be? Let's talk about where you really wanna be. Um, so, I like that. Yeah, that's I like that, I like that, I like that. Jonathan, anything you wanna add to this? 
Yeah, sure. Um, you know, just just speaking on just experience working with, with young adults in, in this situation, you know, two words that come to mind is just pressure and, and insecurity. You know, there's a lot of pressures yeah. on individuals when they are out and it could be negative influence from um, their people, people they're used to being around with. It could be pressure from um, their attached now criminal justice professional, whether it be your parole officer, um, probation departments, um, and pressure from family as well. And just the insecurity around the, the stigma, having now dealing with a criminal um, background in history. So those are all just realities of the, of the really tough aspects of, of um, uh, young adults dealing with kind of trying to get that second, third chance opportunity. So I think what we try to do to alleviate some of that is not, it's not some full court press. It's not, you better come and be with We Are Wild, you Boston staffer every day. Um, and also too, like, a lot, again, there's a big, um, small circle of community providers that are often in the um, lives of, of these young adults. And so we need to communicate with each other to say, okay, like you take the lead, you fall back, we, we're, we're going to spearhead this. And we've been doing a lot of that, which I think is helpful because when there are so many cooks in the kitchen, it's overwhelming. And it can often just like, really sour the soup and the young person is like, well, you're just another, you, yeah, I got three people coming and trying to talk to me and it's just too much. And, um, I don't believe anybody. So, um, you know, uh, people said about relationship building and stuff. So I think there's just a lot of pressure. And, um, if you want to be helpful to the young person, just make sure that you're working in conjunction with anyone else in their life and understanding that is the first step. Wow. Thank you. Thank you for that. Thank you all for speaking on just from what I heard from you all. It's you all spoke on mindfulness, um, just just being mindful of um, situations, people that you encounter. So thank you so much for that. And I want to give a big shout out to Will Dunn because um, I met Will in a different space. And I actually had a friend of mine um, recently get out, was incarcerated, he did a long, a lot of a lot of years. And um, the first person he asked for was Will Dunn. And I didn't even know who Will Dunn was. I actually had to go find him and get his number and call him and introduce myself. But that just speaks on the work. Uh, people, I believe when they get out, um, they remember you and remember some of the words and how you um, are holding them accountable. And they're going to be reaching out to you as soon as they touch down. So I just wanted to add that. And um, thank you all, all these programs for just being mindful with that. Carlita, you got it. Thank you. And I also just enjoyed hearing some of those resolutions, and which brings me to my next question. A lot of this work is surrounded and based on advocacy. I know, Steph, you talked a little bit about how some of your programs are funded through the federal, state, and city. And just, Jonathan, breaking down some of the stigmas of the youth and folks that we're working with. So I guess in what tangible ways does each of your organizations advocate uh, for the people you serve, that can look very different. Um, and, and some people don't even know what adv advocacy looks like. Is it just, I have a, a social worker who can help me out? Or is it just, what are the ways that you feel like the people who come into your programs feel that you're advocating for them? They don't know about these bureaucracies of the systems of what funding means, means that you get to be in this program for X amount of years. So I guess like on a basic level for someone who might be on this call, what does your advocacy look like to them here today? Um, and feel free to jump right in. I started off with Kevin first. So, uh, Steph, I'll set, start with you. Thank you. So one of the, um, the components of our program is to have our young people be ambassadors for our movement, right? Our movement is the uncornered movement, the idea that we can help individuals move from the corner and into college. Um, and it's a risky move, right? Like that's, a serious, like when I tell people that that's what I do and that's our goal and they're not in this sphere, it's a pretty crazy idea. Um, and it's an expensive idea. It doesn't, it doesn't go cheap to be able to convince someone to put a gun down, to come into our building, to get a stipend and to enroll into college. But the investment is incredible. Um, you know, you're paying $100,000 a year for someone to be incarcerated, and we're asking for $20,000 a year to stipend them with the, in, with the return on investment being that they are 
doing positive things with their life. They're getting mental health supports. They're being mentored. They're getting ready to go into college versus sitting in incarceration and not having anything productive and being at a detriment to their own families, to their children when they're not around in the community. So a lot of what we do is learning, having our students learn um, how to go out and to talk about, you know, what they've done and how they have changed themselves and what they need, you know, what, um, what was lacking for them. They never sat around a table talking about what they wanted to be when they grew up and what college they were going to. And our mentors and, you know, folks like Dunn are having those conversations with them for the first time. And some of them are in their twenties and their thirties already. So we have them through uh, different events. We also have our Uncornered Photo Project, which follows um, our staff, our students, and some, uh, some famous faces around the city to learn about the story of when they became Uncornered, because we all can relate to that. We've all been backed in a corner. We've all not thought about what our opportunities and our chances are. And when they're presented to you, and when you have someone that believes in you, that can completely change your life. And it's done in our other CRAs that are those life-changing agents for our young people. Thank you, thank you. And I must say, I, I had a chance to see those photos and that tells a whole bunch, a picture tells a whole bunch of stories. So I look forward to the next round of photos and I think you're right on with putting people at the table. So thank you for sharing that. Um, I feel like I'm, I don't wanna, Jonathan. <laughs> Thank Tell you. me some ways that your group is advocating for our people. Well, it, I think this is a complex question because it's, um, you can, there's two levels. All right, I'll start with advocating to me as being that case manager in my organization standpoint, but whatever the given term at, at the different organization, meaning you have a one-on-one -on -one relationship with that young adult and you're going to bat with them and for them in many different arenas, whether that be with their family, whether that be in a court stand, um, situation or uh, at a school setting. Um, at, at advocating for your client happens every week in kind of one way or another. People have to advocate for their clients within our own program because we have a job program. So that's the real advocating, I think, is actually supporting your um, young adult that you're working with. And that is not just blind advocacy. You have to, it's a whole system of working with your young person where you're providing many opportunities to trust. And that's what advocacy comes down to is trust. And, and we, as a youth development worker, you get burned, you will get burned. And, and that's part of the job, but it's about continuing to pick it up with that young adult and say, okay, like this didn't work out. This is the choice again, that maybe wasn't as positive that you made, but let's go, let, let's just start again. <laughs> let's start from, from the beginning. That's real advocacy. The other advocacy is on an organizational level. And I think there's a, what Why You Boston always wants to do is promote through the numbers and say this was successful and this is how it was successful. And we do wanna lift up our participants of our program, but also to not like marketing tools and stuff like that. Like it, it, it's, it's not about sensationalizing the work and it's not about using a young person's story as saying like, oh, you know, look at this young adult. And, and this is like, this is me putting all their business out there for the whole world to see. But at the same time too, that people do need to know the good work that you do. So organizations have a big responsibility to do it appropriately and some do and some don't. Awesome, thank you for that. And Kevin and Dunn, there was a part two of that question. If you could uh, briefly speak on what does that advocacy look like on reentry and just working with the court system, if you can touch a little bit on that. Go ahead, Dunn. Uh, yeah, so um, advocacy with the uh, courts is, you know, showing up to court with guys. And I, I really personally thank my, my thing, my thing, because I, I was already a thug before. So if I'm putting the work out there, there's no need for me to be sniveling, sniveling and crying when it's time to go to court. 
like one of these different programs. I, I know it's a hustle for the guys when you get locked to have different people come advocacy for you, advocate for you. So, you know, you could try to get the lesser, lesser charge or it looks like you're working in the community. Um, but uh, coming from that side of town, I like to use it as own up to your shit. So you get in a situation, it's time to own up. You, you wore the badge on your chest, like you was the man, go to court, figure it out, get back out here and do something different. So holding them um, accountable. Now it's hard to do it with juveniles when you know they're young, they don't know no better, but you know, guys that get into the game and they really contemplating, they scheming, they know how to make their money, they know how to set up on people, they know how to shoot, they know how to drive, get away with everything. It's like, okay, it's part of the game. You got to own up to your mess when the, you know when it's time to face the court. So um, I do some advocating when it comes down to younger kids, um, but for adults and guys that that get to it, uh, the our program still still does it. That's why I always say it's always two folds the program. But personally, coming from the same struggle, it's like you got to get your stuff together before you have to go in there. And when you go in there, you just gotta own up to it. You, you plead, you plead out if you're gonna plead out, or you fight it on um, the trial and try to get back out here. But to learn something different from the mistake you made, so when you do get back out here, you got the the fighting chance for yourself. Thank you. Right. It sounds like accountability definitely complements advocacy. So both of those hand in hand is, is great. Kevin, do you have anything else to add? Yeah, I mean, I, absolutely. I mean, accountability is huge. And I know a lot of what we talk about is, it, you know, again, we make mistakes. You know, young people make mistakes, right? We, we know all of the research on the brain and, and all of that. We make mistakes. And, um, and, and so there is a, a bit of accountability where, where we tend to do our advocacy, you know, we're, we're really trying to uplift the voice as well, right? And really our staff are working with, whether it's probation, you know, the, the courts, you know, working with attorneys, DYS, other systems, right? Um, really to advocate and just make sure that there's equitable treatment, right? And in making sure that resources and services are, are available too. Right. And so a lot of times, you know, court in, in legal matters, they, they are confusing. They're, they're confusing for, for many of us, let alone a young person, right? They, they, they understand if, you know, they do something, X happens, they don't get arrested. They understand that. But when you're standing there in that courtroom and they start using that legal speak, most of us don't know what you're talking about. And, and so uh, a lot of what we're doing is, is really trying to make sure that we're asking the right questions and really making sure that people explain, you know, what does it mean if you're going to take a plea? What does it mean if you don't, right? Can you, you know, attorney, you know, can you, can you explain that in language we all understand, right? And, and so we're, we're absolutely doing that. We will also, um, so we will go to court when we need it as well. Um, we'll also convene case conferences, right? So, so let's bring all the providers together so we can really work towards a shared understanding of the goals and make sure that the family's voice is at that table, right? What do you need? What do you want? How can we help, right? So we don't keep doing this. And then also making sure we're not duplicating services, right? It doesn't do anyone any good to duplicate services, right? If there are 10 providers involved, that is extremely overwhelming. So we will often try to, to figure out ways to streamline it a bit. Um, and then we tend to be the squeaky wheel. You know, um, We wanna make sure as, as mental health folks, as clinicians, we wanna make sure that the trauma histories, that the mental health challenges are at the forefront. So when folks are thinking about resources or thinking about what's going to happen to this young person, right? They are keeping in mind what a young person has also been exposed to because we know that behaviors are symptomatic, right? And, and we know they don't happen in a vacuum, right? And so we wanna make sure that's at the forefront. So any decision we make, we feel okay. Definitely, well, thank you so much. I, the next question I, is from someone in the chat that I think it might be beneficial to anyone here on this call. Um, as you said, Kevin, when you're in court, what do those legal terms mean? What are the direct resources, uh, maybe for some family members or just friends or individuals and programs that your programs might offer for those who are incarcerated? Um, how, do, how do you get direct access to helping someone who might need help? Uh, what does that look like? And I'm actually even curious for myself. I mean, you get one phone call, one or two. I'm not sure of the process, but what are the programs? If someone has one phone call, who do I call? What are my options? What, what's available to, 
to the people who are not able to know what those are outside um, behind the bar. Yeah. And, and I wasn't sure, Carmen, if you were asking that of, of me in particular or. or... Sorry, um, I guess maybe I'll, Don, I know you work a little bit with, I guess for youth and for folks over 24 years old, um, I want to make sure that we do answer the question, though, uh, because there is someone in the chat who wants to know what is it like to I know the juvenile process might be different from someone who's a little bit older. So I guess let me see. I would I would really like to hear from Don, seeing that you work with the older uh, Don or Steph who work with the older group and maybe either someone from Youth Connect or while you can speak a little bit as well. What's the actual question? Sorry, what are the programs for folks who are incarcerated? So if someone has to, is going to jail, 26 year old is, is incarcerated by tomorrow, what are their family's resources? How can they reach out for help? Like what is, what is their options? Okay, so programmatically that's not a, a, a um, focus on the families, it's the actual individual to try to get them to have that mind shift change. But again, like I said, I can't work with the individual and build a relationship and not be part or know his family. So it becomes anybody in our program, or if you reach out, the directors will sit down and talk about whatever issue that came to us and we'll try to navigate and figure it out. If we had to call JMAC over YRU, whatever it is, um, who can help the situation out, we'll just reach out to make sure that person, um, family gets service. Because it's, again, it's hard to just work with someone and you build a relationship and your, your family has an issue or problem. On the program side, it's not written up, but on a human side, you have no choice but to know somebody's cousin, mother, daughter, et cetera. Thank you, and I'm sorry for, I should have made it a little bit more clear, uh, but that's still those components of working with families, just knowing the relationships all contribute to what, uh, ultimately what someone's resources and options are. Um, so thank you for that. Yeah, can I, um, oh, I have no, go ahead, Come on, Kevin, you're fine, go yeah, ahead. Yeah, no, so I mean, I think for us at Youth Connect, right, so our referrals come through the Boston Police Department. Um, and so when we are reaching out to a family, and let's say a young person gets incarcerated, right, we, we're absolutely gonna work with the family, right, I think to Dunn's point. Right, we're going to work with the family because it's it's holistic, right? We know, you know, part of what a young person incarcerated is going to need is their family, right? And whatever that constellation might look like, right? Their guardian, their family, whatever. So we're we're working with family to kind of say, hey, let's figure out the ways that we can continue to support this young person, so they are starting to get some of that, you know, beginning to see they're not isolated. There, there are some supports, and when they come out, here's how we're going to be able to help too. So we may actually, you know, work with the family that says, hey, you're really struggling with this. How can we get you the support you need, right? Because there's often a sense of shame, right? So how can we get the support you need, right? Are you going to visit this young person? Are you going to go visit? Because we will have some families say, I told them if they get incarcerated, I'm not coming to visit, right? So we might work with a family member. Yeah, it may take some time to sort of talk that through. Hey, what does that mean? What's the message? You know, if the young person doesn't have their village, what, what happens then, right? Um, and then, you know, in, in terms of, and I don't know if this was part of the question of sort of like, well, how, if let's say they're not connected to you, how do they get connected to you, right? Well, it, you know, like I said, our, our referrals come through the, the Boston police. We do take also some referrals from community members, like Rasan can attest to that, um, you know, and it's all about capacity. And um, so we have plenty of families who walk into the station and say, I need help, I need help. Um, I really want my, my child to get on a better path. And usually at that point, an officer will say, have you talked to Youth Connect? We have a social worker. And that's how, how the relationship begins. Thank you, thank you. And I hope that answered um, the person's question in the chat. And if not, the resources are here even after this call. Um, so thank you. And I'm gonna pass it over to Rasan. So next, um, I would like to highlight some of the frontline staff and what they do within you guys' organization. Um, I'll start off with YLU Boston. Can you speak on your career development team and the importance of the work that they do? 
Great, thank you, of course. Um, while you Boston does boil down to two main departments and one are our case managers who do um, uh, similar work to other organizations, direct service staff here as well. So I won't talk about them. <laughs> and I wanted to talk more about our career development team because it is a lot of the reason why a young adult gets referred to, to YOU. It is a subsidized job. And so basically um, we've created a multi-tier job system. It's been around for a decade, but it's definitely changed um, since the pandemic started. We um, were able to shift from only in-person jobs between teams of young people, like how I started supervising. And um, for the last two years, we've been able to have fully virtual and or hybrid job opportunities where there's, um, you know, Zoom-based workshops, but they're hands-on experiences. So it's not just about, you know, either reading articles or hearing from guest speakers. It is actually like doing the skill set, whether it be baking, um, it could be about fitness, it could be um, computer uh, design, whether it be graphic design or, you know, even coding experience. Um, and so young people get to do their schoolwork, um, but then also to still engage when people weren't meeting in person or getting in groups. We used to, you know, pick up in vans and go to a work site. And obviously COVID-19 was um, putting a stop to, to many of those things, but, you know, we are hoping to be able to still work in person safely with our young adults um, on job sites that are, you know, allowing for proper space and, and taking the necessary precautions. Um, we are also rolling back out our internship program. So while you Boston is unique in the sense that we have a structured job that mimics the private sector working world, whether it be entry level retail or food service, or we're talking about more advanced careers um, that could be long term for the individual, whether that be construction, whether that be medical, whether it be um, you know anything that requires further education. So um, our career development team does a good job of both understanding the barriers that young people come to us with while also adhering to a employment contract that differentiates between this is going to be acceptable at your next opportunity when you're not with a youth program and this is you know this is what's not so um, it's very valuable young people are suspended terminated from employment however the other department will always kind of catch that young person and walk them through other youth agencies for them or be their case manager and also to um, they can always be re-enrolled in our job program and so yeah that's that's kind of I could again I could go on and on about it but that is like the quicker version of it and you know just the experience the work the career exploration experience that they're getting now is way better than it was in 2019 or before so um, there were a lot of positive um, outcomes to the to the hard times that we've all been dealing with um, since the pandemic started. Good stuff. Good stuff. Quick question. How many people do you guys have enrolled there at YOU? Because you said everything is virtual at, at this time or in the summertime. Is it more numbers? Yeah, how, no. How's your numbers look? It's a great question. So every year YOU Boston in total will, will serve about 400 young adults. Okay. But right now, like today, 75 young people will log in and work and be paid and learn a hard skill. Um, there's a fashion design group. Um, there's and then there's uh, leadership groups as well. So and there's several interns working. So today there's 75. And then in July, the summer, when most youth programs uh, expand their services, we'll be working with about 130 to 150 um, just in those July 4th to you know end of August type of months. Um, and then again, throughout the year, it's, it's typically about 75 use at a time. Okay, cool. Thank you, Jonathan. Thank you. Um, next, Boston on Corner. Can you speak on your college readiness advisors and the importance of the work that they do, please? Yes, sir. The importance of the college readiness advisors is if they're not equipped to be 
grown men in the community, then they not, they're not going to have nothing to offer the younger generation to change and do anything. So nice. it's twofold. We put energy, time, resources, programs into the staff. Um, we work with a, a foundation called the Nubian Square Foundation, who does who guys who are just focused on um, equity and ownership. And so we're trying to take the staff to have equity and ownership in their community where we can lead the students and uh, the guys in our program to start having that same um, concept on having ownership and equity. Um, for so long, we, you know, I don't want to get into the white, black thing, but for so long, we've always tried to give back without having the business side to the table. So we're trying to teach the younger guys now. Everything is giving back, but you also need to know your business too. So we got the classes for uh, financial literacy to help um, their credit scores get good. When your credit scores start getting good, you have a two year window to get a job so you can prove your taxes, so you can start making these big business moves. So for our staff that own real estate, property and everything else, it becomes, we're not here as a program just telling you to change your life, just to change your life. We have been through the same stuff and this is what we learned off of bumping our heads 20 years ago. Now you can either get a, a 20 year bid, a 15 year bid and get out here and do it over. But who's to say you're not gonna be the one that get killed or um, paralyzed where it slows you down. So we try to show a whole different path of financial literacy, home ownership and equity to the staff. So then we can lead on to the next generation to get them out of that mindset of selling drugs is the only thing you can do in life. And we're proving it by the staff doing what they need to do. Um, with the Nubian Square Foundation, they're trying to, is try, trying to build uh, 20 black millionaires. So we get, there's five guys already that make over a hundred thousand a year, all from neighborhoods, from projects projects from throughout Boston. So it's, it's, it's nothing where it's a, it's a thought process, like maybe it works. No, we got guys that's making that type of money from your neighborhood that was the same guys that was running around having people sell drugs for them. Now they're doing something different because they learned something different and you can't take the knowledge away once you learn it. Stephanie, would you like to add anything? No, I mean, you know, the question was what the CRA is bringing and like clearly Don knows he is a CRA, um, but for someone who observes them working together, um, I see the CRAs as just such confidence builders for our young people, someone that believes in them, that is there for them unconditionally. We are one of the programs that doesn't have an exit. <laughs> um, you know, if you're incarcerated, if you have some bumps along the road, our CRAs really stick with our young people, which is a unique aspect of the program. Um, whether they, you know, if they're rearrested, we're right here as soon as they come back out. So just having someone that really truly believes in them, even when they don't believe in themselves, um, you know, that's a really transformational relationship. Thank you. Thank you both. Thank you. That, that sounds amazing. Youth Connects, Kevin, your last um, would like to spoke to you about your licensed clinical social workers and the importance, especially their work in contents with the partnership with Boston Police. So I know you brought it up before you guys are housed in different districts. Um, yeah. Can you please, you know, explain a little bit about that, please? Yeah, sure. Um, so a little over 25 years ago, um, you know, Youth Connect was started to really be a resource to officers who were frustrated by all the community violence and um, involving young people and in, in not having a real alternative at that time to arrest or, or feeling that they didn't. Um, you know, and they, you know, there was this realization that arrest and incarceration was, was often not really the, the, the solution or the deterrent, um, that more was really needed. And so Youth Connect was, was born. Um, you know, our social workers, with, they build these strong relationships with officers. That's really, it, it has to be based on mutual trust and sort of this common goal of helping young people. And um, our, our services are confidential, right? Because often people will, will ask about that and it is confidential. So while officers will give the referral, um, they respect the fact that they may not necessarily after giving the referral, know anything after that, right? unless a young person and their family has given permission for us to be able to share. And, and I, can, I can honestly say that the number of times that we reach out to a family and just say, officer so-and-so was so worried about your, your son, 
for your daughter. And they asked us to reach out. We get a lot of families who are so appreciative of that. And we'll actually give permission to say, can you just please let that officer know, thank you. Um, and, and so I think that's important to note. Um, so our, you know, our social workers, we know that, you know, given the history of sort of mistrust, I, I think they're, they're, it is so powerful when building the relationship, right? To sort of take this relationship slow, right? And, you know, the great thing about our, I think our work is that it's not, um, it, it, we don't rely on insurance, right? We're very fortunate in that we have so many supporters of the work that we do. We, we don't take insurance, it is absolutely free. And so what that means is that we can literally take as much time as a young person needs because it's about building trust and relationship. And, and so, you know, I, I can think of times when maybe we literally just start with working with a young person who says, I don't need counseling, I don't need any. Okay, well, you know what, I'll take a job, I'll take a job. And then we go, all right, you don't need counseling, you don't need any of that, we're gonna start with a job, I got you. And then I'm like, Jonathan, or we call up, <laughs> you know, any number of yeah. providers, right, our partners, and we're like, can we please get this young person a job? And that's the hook, right? Thank you. And, you know, and, that, and that's the hook. And then from there, you know, you, you, it, it's amazing to see how many will say, I don't do counseling, only to figure out that, you know, a year in, what they've been doing the whole time is talking about their feelings and doing the counseling, but I'll call it whatever you want. We're just chatting, um, yeah. and, and that's the beauty of not having to worry about um, insurance. I think you know, in, you know, twelve sessions and you're all done. Um, so, so we are fortunate in in that, you know. And, and I can certainly think of of young people who maybe did start with that small hook, you know, and because then they begin to say, okay, you do care. You you heard what I said, and you helped me get connected to whomever I needed to get connected to the village, so to speak, you know. So, um, so that's that's what we do. Very cool. Thank you. Thank you for all of those. Um, we're going to switch gears a little bit and maybe talk about some self care. Uh, we all can imagine work can be emotionally challenging, challenging for all of us. Um, we're turning it for those that are tuning into this lunch and learn, um, and faced with these realities on a you know on a regular basis. Can you all tell me how are you all supporting some of your frontline staff or some of your clients when it comes to self care? And um, I'll start off with YOU Boston. Great, well, I would definitely say that we are much more flexible in um, 2022 than we ever were before when it comes to our staff and real, realizing that our staff have life challenges as well with, in addition to helping young people navigate their own challenges and so, you know, for me, when we think about self-care, what I just practice as a director is just being open and honest with what you need and being really flexible with allowing staff to have time to recharge themselves, reset, setting boundaries as well from a manager standpoint and my managers as well to saying when people are off, let them be off when, you know, when it comes time to um, you working hard. That's, that's one thing, like one little thing is to be like, none of us, I don't know what, whatever level at you Boston, no one clocks in and clocks out, but also at the same time too, like if you're going above and beyond on that given day or that given week, or even a tough month where you're really like, we're going to launch our summer program. So obviously people are going to be working a lot more intensely in the time leading up to it. So um, there are times when as a staffer, you need to ramp up the time you're putting into the work you're doing, but at the same time as well, there's, there's a lot of little things that people can do to not be overexerting the staff that work for them. And, you know, I've been at YU Boston for 10 years and I have several staff that have been at YU for over five years. And so, you know, we've all seen staff that just will burn themselves out. And so that's not valuable at all. In, in my eyes, it's more about saying, I would like someone else to be here for 10 years because there's just some, some things that we, we can't replace. So I would just say boundaries, respecting people's time and, and allowing people to really value uh, getting a break from, from the work. 
Thank you. Thank you. Um, Stephanie, Will, you guys want to um, put anything or add anything to that? Yeah, you know, for us, like Jonathan said, trying to keep people from burnout and um, secondary trauma. So one of the ways that we prioritize self-care is just ensuring that our staff have access to mental health supports. So we actually have a clinical director that handles any immediate crises as well as like daily things. Um, we have immediate access to an employee assistance program. And then our clinical director provides access to mental health providers to our CREs without a waiting period. And oh, Uncornered nice. actually pays any of the costs associated with um, any of our staff seeing a mental health clinician or um, oh. you know, anyone. So, and um, just you know, to quickly add that sets a role model tone for our young people. They see that the people that they look up to in CREs who are very strong, very well put together individuals are still working on themselves. And that gives them the okay and the clear almost to go ahead and pursue that as well. And then we have a clinical team that works with our young people to make sure that they can get those supports as well. Okay, thank you, Stephanie. Kevin, anything from you? I need you to be, I need you to be very, very quick. Uh, because we got maybe five minutes left and we want to get maybe two of these questions um, answered. Um, so Rashawn, can you, go ahead. I'm sorry. Let me, well. ask, let me just ask something real quick that um, Steph missed out that because of the trauma situation, all the staff has um, unlimited um, vacation time. So we don't have to wait, you know, eight to four weeks or eight weeks for the year. So whenever you feel right. as though you need your time off or you need self-care, right. um, it could be every, every other week if it's, if it's needed. So that was one of the um, things we set into place just to make sure everybody's situated on self-care. Word. Thank you. Thank you for putting that out there. Yep. Wow. That is amazing. I love hearing all of that. Um, you know, I, I love a lot of what you were talking about, um, well, both of you stuff and, uh, uh, and done. Um, so in terms of self-care for us, I mean, we, we, we are a mental health program. So for us, I mean, talking about self-care is like, that's like, that's what we do. Um, it is about not burning out. The work is undeniably hard. Um, so we, we actually make self-care a part of our performance review um, and it's worked into the budget. I think similarly to what you were talking about, Steph, um, we, we make sure that everyone has access to uh, professional development, which includes thinking about self-care. So doing mindfulness and anything you need, you're gonna ask for it, but you have that as a part of your, your, your budget, so to speak. Um, we, we also make sure to do self-care plans with folks. It is a part of the performance review, like I said, so they are going to identify when you're sitting with your supervisor, what's your plan? And it will be reviewed periodically. So you to either celebrate or just say, okay, how do we step that up a bit? Because you had a lot happen. Um, so we will do that. We, we also, everybody uh, does uh, biweekly yoga um, through, a, through a donor. We have biweekly yoga, so we, we do our yoga. And, um, and then everybody has um, access to Headspace, which is a mindfulness and meditation uh, app. So everyone has that membership and a, a membership to a Clearly Clinical Podcast um, as, as well. So we're, we're trying to you know, make sure that everyone has access to what they need. And we do make sure that folks know they should be thinking about therapy for themselves. And we will make sure that they have time so they don't have to take sick time or any of that. It's like, nope, you have a therapy session, go for it. Um, it's all great. So try to be quick on that, Rasan. No, you're good. You're good. Carlita, do you mind asking your question just before we get off? We have maybe two, three minutes. I want to be able to get that one out there and I'm quiet. Of course, no problem. So the last part of the conversation is really just focusing. I know we have some community partners here. So what are the best ways that we can support uh, some community partners as for uh, potential partnerships, collaborations, just future, just information sessions that community partners can know so that they're sharing with you know folks before they're even getting to trouble. So are there any, I guess, opportunities throughout the year that community partners who might be on this call now can jot down, whether it's the, the annual Uncornered project, like what are some programs and, and ways that people can connect? Uh, that's for anyone of, of the organizations that might have some annual or unique programs that uh, folks can 
Yeah, I would say that since we're in the season, it's it, May and June are just peak referral times for young people to get summer jobs with us. Um, so youth in Boston do have several options. Um, what I would say would be the best for YU Boston is a young adult that um, is facing, Barry has less support than others that you know might be dealing with community safety concerns um there's not going to be just, just like an online like our referral is online yes but once the adult whether that be parental or not just someone who knows that young person once they make that referral it will be a very hands-on process from then on out and the sooner the better for a young person to have their summer job lined up so just being on our website making a referral it takes five minutes and that's just the best way to support us right now Carlita, you mentioned our photo project, which we're tremendously proud of. We actually will be having a new installation this fall in October. Um, and we also just had the opportunity to work with partners from Stand Together. And we have a documentary coming out um, that I've seen a clip of, and it gives me goosebumps when I see it highlighting the work that we do. So if we're going to be having a watch party, um, and our website is going to have all of that information. So anyone that's, um, you know, that's been watching, that's intrigued by by the work we do, please stay in touch with us. Um, we'd love to show you these things. Of course, thank you so much. Um, I think you know, uh, if there's any other organizations. Kevin. Um, yeah, I mean, so for us, it's it's, it's slightly different in, in the sense of, um, it, you know, you, we don't have sort of like a website where people come on to make a referral, so to speak, right? So, but I would encourage folks to check out our website to, to look at ways to perhaps support us um, in the work that we do. Um, we are always looking for opportunities as well for, for more resources for our young people and for our staff, right? So trainings um, are always key. Um, but again, you know, a lot of it is about being able to support us in what we do as a program because we do you know, we are a free program. We, we certainly fundraise our money to keep it free. Um, so, you know, any way that folks can support us, that would be great. Um, and then, you know, in the fall, we do have a partnership breakfast where we, we bring together partners to really celebrate um, partnership and to really uh, highlight the work of our social workers and the work of other providers around, you know, the city. Um, so definitely check out our website and you'll see that information there. One more question. I have a question. Um, lastly, is there something going on in your organization this summer or fall that you guys would like to highlight for the audience? Perhaps staff members, programs, um, anything that you have going on so you connect. I know you guys do the partnership breakfast, the community. Can you speak on that? Why that's important? Why, um, you know, as far as community partners here in the hospital, some of our community engagement people, why it's maybe important for us to attend that or if we could? Yeah, um, as I was mentioning before, the, you know, our partnership breakfast is um, in November this year. We'll be back in person, which is amazing, um, as long as COVID allows, for sure. Um, you know, honestly, I, I think it's important to come out because it is an opportunity to really see and hear from, I, I think, officers, uh, young people uh, as well. We will often have a, a young person speak about the importance of the work and the relationships um, and, and the referrals. So my, my hope is that folks will join us. Uh, it will be on our website, um, which I think is probably in the, the chat. Um, but, but I do hope that folks come. It's an opportunity to also hear directly from officers who, who do attend and force and, and, you know, and will be there to uh, you know, answer questions and just talk about the, the work uh, that we all do. Um, and again, it's about celebrating all partners, you know, so we do a lot of talking about um, those who are in the room as well with us. Okay. Thank you. College Bound, do you guys have anything, um, any of the end of the year celebrations, summer celebrations, anything that um, you guys want to share with us at the moment? I know you brought up something uh, done. Hello. Family. Happy Thursday afternoon, everybody. Yeah, so we've got our um, milestone event that we plan usually for the fall. Um, so we're hoping to have that back in person with everyone. Um, so yeah, always trying to plan new things. So definitely just check our website. Thank you. Thank you so much. And Jonathan, last but best, can you speak on this <laughs> summer jobs program and your end of the summer celebration, please? Yeah. Yeah. That typically happens um, right around the, the August 18th. Um, 
and it's been uh, virtual. It will be most likely either virtual or slightly hybrid again this, this summer. So I will keep Rasan, I'll keep you all updated on when it's 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 hammered out. But it usually focuses on youth, so youth project presentations and some community partners. Nice. So we're going to wrap this up. I wanted to just maybe give us some time anywhere from 30 seconds to a minute. Our uh, last thoughts, um, anything that we want to take away, anything that you maybe want to highlight or give a shout out to um, before we end this. Um, I'll start out. I'm thankful and I value everybody on this call and in this realm. I especially want to give a shout out to you guys programs with your frontline workers. So when I think of Kevin over there, you know, I work really close with Coral. Um, Jonathan, I work very close with the Carloses, the Christians, and they're at um, College Bound, Uncornered, um, Lewis, Lewis Rodriguez. That's my brother right there. So I just want to acknowledge you all and the great work that you guys done, even through this pandemic. Um, so often we're kind of focused on clients and not really thinking of our individuals, our staff, and um, you guys have maintained the work. Um, and haven't stopped. So I just wanted to acknowledge that and throw that out there. I'm gonna do this popcorn style and pass it to the next person. I'm gonna pass it to Carlita. Thank you so much, Rasan. Thank you to the community partners, uh, to the YOU, Youth Connect, Boston and Cornered. Um, this has just been an amazing experience hearing and learning about all of the programs that you guys have you know, just managing and giving back to the community. So. Uh, special thanks to Rasan for inviting me here um, and just to all of our panelists and to all of our community partners and Brigham's and Women's and just everyone who has contributed to this conversation and overall overall being of making sure that um, our youth and people have other opportunities to to grow and lead in Boston. So thank you so much. Popcorn to staff. Uh, just a thank you for Rasan for putting this together, Carlita for moderating, um, and just the great folks that I get to share this work and space with. Um, I appreciate you all. It's really fun to just talk about this work together. Um, and yeah, thank you for everyone who came and listened. And I'll pass it over to Kevin. Awesome, thank you. Um, yeah, I guess I just want to say thank you. Shout out to you know to our moderators, you know, Carlina and, and, and Rasan, but but um, but also you know Rasan, thinking about just uh, you know you embody the the sense of it takes a village, right? Um, and and so I appreciate you 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 helping to pull this together. I think anytime there's there's a need, we we know you know we can reach out to to you and, and others at um at the hospital and, and just get the needs met you know i think about covid and, and how much you know the hospital came through and making sure that people had what they needed um when it was so hard to do it so uh, so again just thank you for including us and i'll wrap us up so um everyone well, Rasan knows how much love I have for Rasan, so I'll just say that quickly, of course, but thank you to, as well to Carlita for moderating, but also to Cheryl Madison and Ron Asia. I know that not being on camera, you don't get as much love all the time, but you did so much work to get this and so many other ones ready. No one does prep work like this group, so thank you to you all. Yeah. Yeah. I'm the black sheep of the group. I always talk trash if, if the if a group or a meeting doesn't go right or any faking faking anything, I'll be the first one to be the black sheep to talk trash. So I appreciate coming on here. I appreciate um um the stuff I heard from Kevin. Like I already put on my blackboard to make sure I reach out to you. Um J Mac, you know, we already kick it all the time anyway. So this is just something that's that's great to see um the movement taking place where no one's trying to act like a a, a individual program is everything like you do your part and that's all that counts not sit on the throne and say somebody's better than the next person just because they got a program or a budget or whatever so i just appreciate the love and get ready to work with Brigham and women's and do some big things with y'all let's go we need y'all i appreciate y'all please enjoy your day please keep being great you never know who's paying attention and who you're inspiring on that note we out of here thank you so much